Hello and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. I'm Dee, the managing editor at Annie Femme. I also run the anime blog, The Jose Next Door, and you can find me on Twitter at Jose Next Door. I'm Lauren Orsini. I contribute to Anime Feminist, and I also have my own blog, Otaku Journalist, otakujournalist.com. But most of the time, you can find me on Twitter at Lauren in Space. And I'm Peter Phobian. I'm an Associates Features Editor at Crunchyroll and a contributor and editor at Anime Feminist. And today we are doing our season retrospective for the spring 2018 season. Uh, there were a lot of shows and a ton of sequels, so uh, I think we'll just kind of get right into it. Um, as a reminder to folks, we put out a preview guide at the beginning of the season, and we kind of rank the shows based on the amount of like feminist-relevant potential we think they might have, or the kind of things we think um, feminist-minded viewers might be concerned about. Um, and so we're going to kind of use that list for the podcast. We'll sort of start from the bottom, which would be um, like red flags, and then we'll kind of move our way up. Um, most of the red flag, like pit of shame type shows, we are not, none of us are watching. So we can kind of just skim right up to, um, I believe yellow flags, which is Uma Musume, pretty derby, or as I think everyone is calling it horse girls. And it looks like all three of us watched this one. Yeah. Yeah. To Did, the end. Wow. All three of us finished. Wow. Yeah. Good job. PA works. I know they, they, they hooked us. They hooked us with their horse girls. Um, so what did y'all think? Uh, it was, it was okay. a lot of fun. Yeah. I Peter think, sounds a little bit lukewarm. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was uh, pretty funny at times. They did. They were pretty good at, like, injecting humor into scenes. I think my favorite character was probably Goldship for that reason. Same uh, here. Yeah. They, Goldship was wonderful. Usually, like, the lol random character, I don't, I think it's just kind of, like, a poor attempt at humor. But, like, it seemed like they were also trying to make some deep anime cuts in there. Like, when she was hammering those logs into the side of a hill, that was a... Freaking Hajime no Ippo reference. I have no idea who thought of that, but they deserve some sort of medal. I th- thought, I mean, I think they it was pretty well executed for what they were doing. At the end of the day, it was kind of a hard to uh, sympathize with a lot of their goals because the characters felt really two-dimensional, given the story that they were kind of putting out and the kind of absurd premise of horse girls that race and then get to do an idol concert if they win. Uh, I think it was a really good job. I liked it for the same reason I like Love Live. It was just really fun to root for these girls as they go towards their goals. And of course, it's really fun to ship them. <laughs> that is true. I feel like um, Suzuka and Special Week were about as canon as a, as a couple can get without being like actually canon. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really like like mother, like daughter with Special Week there. I mean, Special she's, Week she does have having two moms. Two moms. Mm-hmm. And the show is really cute about that, too. Like, the whole way through, it's like, oh, it's nice that you have two moms, and everybody's really supportive. Um, I mean, one of the moms is dead, so it's not perfect, but uh, it's also anime, so the odds of you having two living parents are exceedingly low. Um, yeah, I I was surprised at how much I enjoyed uh, The Horse Girls. Um, it was, I'm admittedly very hard up for a lady-led sports series that doesn't just, like, relentlessly sexualize the characters. Um, and Horse Girls was that. Like, it was a sports show about, like, these characters who were athletes who were, you know, trying to achieve their goals. And they had respected rivalries and big races against against different kinds of opponents and uh the show there was no i don't think the camera ever framed them in like a sexualized or objectifying way um i mean there's the there's the crappy we've talked about this before there was the crappy there's the crappy groping joke that keeps coming up with their trainer yeah, which even sucks. at the end yeah yeah even at the end the like ruined scene. a perfectly fluffy ending by bringing up that that terrible you know in lots of quotation marks joke um but even that, like, there's never any, fr- it's, the framing of those scenes, like, as bad as they are, like, it's never really, it's it's played for comedy, bad comedy, but not for, like, titillation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the idea is, allegedly, he's he's really trying to see if they're good athletes. Yeah. Uh, again, bad <laughs> joke. Yeah. But I do at least, I do at least appreciate that the show treats its characters like athletes, not like fetish objects for the audience i guess is is how i would say that um, yeah which is fascinating considering like the whole reason to c- cross a girl with an animal is ideally you'd think not ideally but conceptually you'd think that would make them easier to objectify yeah i thought it was going to be a fan servicey show yeah um, going into it Same. um i guess i mean pa works as a, as a studio doesn't tend to do a ton of stuff like that, which I do appreciate about Pretty them. Pretty good, yeah. Um, but I was expecting that. 
Um, and like even like they they had a beach episode, and I was like, oh no, it's a beach episode. And it was like there was a part where they like actually had to swim for their training, and they were in um, like athletic swimsuits. Yeah, and I was, was going like, to bring that up. This is so nice. I like um, I was I was holding my breath, and then they were all wearing athletic gear, and I was like, oh wow, really? This is, that was pretty uh, encouraging. And again, the camera. There's never any like creepy zooms or anything like that. Um, I I I appreciated I appreciated Horse Girls for being a nice. Um, sports show with moe leanings i guess is how i would describe it yeah i think the the when the camera did that most was probably when they did the butler cafe so like when the, there was the the biggest like in universe point where they were supposed to be where anybody was making a big deal out of their physical appearance was when the girls were dressed up as butlers um, oh i do remember that honestly, i thought that I was kind of cute yeah yeah i mean i don't i, I think that was funny that was mm-hmm. good yeah, I uh, also think that it had a like probably my favorite subplot in the story was the whole sports injury thing, which I thought was like actually kind of an interesting thing that's not often done. I mean, we just got after the rain, which like that was part of the story, but I don't think it really dealt with the sports injury part of it very deeply. I'm gonna say I have to say getting back on the horse, don't I? <laughs> but uh... <laughs> I mean, you had to; it was right there. So I I was kind of disappointed with the end result where he's just like, oh, both of you made a promise, right? And then they were magically fixed. Uh, But appreciated it addressing that, especially because the real horse Silent Suzuka, like it got uh, injured during a race. Of course, the real Silent Suzuka got put down. Um, So that made me super nervous when she had the (laughs) the real life injury. Um, But I I thought that was a kind of a cool little subplot they did that you don't often see in sports anime. Yeah, in sports anime, frequently that's the beginning of the end, an injury. Yeah. I think you have Kuroko's basketball, Yamashi pedal. Somebody gets injured and then they That's it for him. They become less relevant. Yeah, so having her, you know, work through that and come back from it um was a like you guys said kind of a unique arc and and a good one too. Again, like if you've got people watching the show who are who are athletes, like I think having those those kind of um inspiring arcs are really nice too. So yeah, I think I think yeah, I, Horse Girls was surprisingly nice. It's not necessarily a show that I'm gonna want to like come back to again and again or anything like that, but I I enjoyed it all the way through. I think I would say yeah, so. good for Idol fans, but pretty good regardless. Yeah, I, the thing is, I don't even I don't even think of it as an Idol show. I think of it as a sports show because of the the different sort of narrative beats it hit and the fact that the concerts kind of just get ignored after about episode three. They're like, yeah, we don't actually give a crap about the concerts either was the way I kind of felt about the idol elements of it. But yeah, I mean, maybe you guys disagree with that. Well, like, as someone who likes idol shows, I, I just loved um, watching them, like, work towards goals the way that that you, you frequently see, like, and the teamwork involved in that and the shipping potential in that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I guess there is some, there's definitely some crossover t- between uh, kind of the, the beats that idol shows hit and the beats that a lot of sports series hit. So Uma Musume, uh made that crossover happen. I guess we can kind of just keep moving up this list here. Um, the next one I have tentatively marked is Lupin the Third Part 5. Peter, I know you were watching that at the midway point. Did you drop off? Uh, yeah. I mean, I intend to finish it. I, there's really nothing mm-hmm. about the series that made me want to quit it. It was just kind of kind of like a, a time and effort kind of thing. I, I had too many shows to keep up with and something had to drop. Yeah. Yeah, I hit the I hit the end of the Ami, the first Ami arc, which I think was like five or six, and I felt like the show was over, and I just never had any real desire to go back. I was like, oh, I finished an arc, cool. Oh, I didn't start it because I haven't seen a lot of the old Lupin, and I'm wondering how is it as an entrance point? Tough for me to say because it's not my entrance point, but I haven't seen any of the old stuff. I've only seen a, a woman called Fujiko Mine, and then I watched part four. Most Lupin series are, you can pretty much just jump right into them. Um, if I was going to give you a starting point, I would say that uh, part four is a little, I think is a little bit more um, entry level friendly. And I kind of just enjoyed the aesthetic of that one better as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you wanted to just start with part five, I don't think there's any real reason you couldn't. Good to know. Um, especially if you've, you know, lived in the anime verse. And so you have just kind of a general idea of who the characters are. Um, okay. Neither of us, none of us were watching Dance of the Dragons or Fist of the Blue Sky. So we can jump up. Um, just real quick. I do want to mention this cause it didn't get mentioned in the mid season really. Um, I did the Cute High Earth Defense Club Happy Kiss, which was the sort of, not sequel, spinoff, I guess, to the Cute High Earth Defense Club love series, which I loved so much. I dropped Happy Kiss halfway through. 
So really? I guess that I guess that tells you something about how because it is so they they lost their series composer and I know that I know that script writing in anime is like it's collaborative and I can't guarantee that um, Michiko Yotoke not being on the project like I can't guarantee she had that much influence on it but I do tend to love her writing and for me I could tell that there was something missing and for me anyway it definitely felt like it was her. Um, her ability to write just like this amazing back and forth, stupid, wonderful dialogue. Yeah, I loved the first two and I started watching this new one and I saw that the characters were different. I was just like, uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to invest in new characters that I don't know <laughs> when I have so many other things I can watch this season. Yeah, there were certain things about it I kind of liked. There was an element of the the two like, rivalry teams like the bad guys and the good guys like knew who each other was in and out of school as opposed to in the first season where they like didn't know each other's identities mm -hmm. and it leads and a couple of them are like friends and have been friends this whole time and it leads to this kind of like it reminded me of those old looney tune cartoons where the coyote and the sheepdog would like punch in and fight each other and then punch out and go home together it, it kind of led to that sort of a dynamic, which was sort of fun. But the, the one-off episodes just, I, they just weren't, they were just kind of bland. Like, they, it just kind of fell flat for me, and I wasn't having fun, really, so I kind of just dropped off. Nothing about it that I would, like, warn people away from, but um, it was kind of disappointing, given how much I, I enjoyed love. But I, I, I feel like the screenwriters um, uh, not having Michiko Yokote on um, hurt kind of the rhythm of the series a bit. So that was a little bit of a bummer. And then let's just keep climbing up this list. I guess I'm just going to keep talking because the next show that um, that we can discuss here is uh, Tada Never Falls in Love. Spoiler alert, I guess, for folks at home. I don't know how much I should go into this. I'll keep it vague. It's end of season. It was fine. It, there <laughs> was, um, Caitlin talked about Caitlin talked about this in the mid-season, so I won't go too deep into it. There is one just absolutely insufferable supporting character. Otherwise, the cast is the cast is nice. Some of them I liked quite a bit. Um, a few of them were just kind of there, and it felt like the show didn't need to have as many characters as it did. Um, it probably would have worked better as a movie. I'm not sure they really had enough story for a full 12. Was it 13? It might have been 13 episodes. It was a nice little uh, school rom-com type show, but it, it's something that I think I'm going to kind of forget about. And I ended up being sort of disappointed with it because I was really excited to see the director, Yamazaki Mitsue, uh, get her own work. And um, she's not credited as the like original creator. So um, she may have been working off somebody else's story, so maybe I can excuse it for that. Um, but I just, I thought it would have a little bit more pizzazz. And it looked really nice. Like, it looked great. But the the writing was just sort of, mm -hmm. sort of by the book. This might be a spoiler, but did he fall in love? Did he do do that? That is that is the spoiler. Uh, the title the title is a lie. He does indeed fall in love. Um, I, I know knew it. one. Yeah, one thing. I mean, like, I don't think we ever really thought it would happen, but I know there were some um, some folks watching, myself included, who were kind of like, maybe Tata actually doesn't fall in love, and like the show is like playing with rom com tropes by not actually having them get together. Um, yeah, no, it, it's kind of a Roman holiday sort of send off is, is basically what the series is and it's fine. Again, I watched it all the way through. Um, I looked forward to the new episodes, but, um, it's not something I'm ever going to go back to. So, uh, there was an entire episode narrated by the cat that was wonderful. So, you know, episode three, check that out. <laughs> um, I, love Garfield. I look forward to seeing, um, I look forward to seeing what else Yamazaki does because I do still think she's, she's a very good, um, visual director for sure. But I was a little sad that her, her first, um, original project wasn't, wasn't more, uh, striking, I guess. Uh, next on the list is a show that I dropped, but the two of you kept up with, um, which is, uh, definitely, I think one of those sort of messes. I'm curious to hear you guys talk about it. Magical Girl Ore. Uh, I reviewed this for Anime News Network, so I was there every week sharing, sharing my opinions in real time. Mm-hmm. And I was very disappointed. What about you, Peter? I don't know if I ever had any kind of expectation around the show, so I don't know if it'd be accurate to describe myself as disappointed. It was very confusing. At times, I wasn't quite sure what the show was trying to go for. It had, like, that great episode where they just completely ignore the story entirely to destroy... I hated that episode. Yeah, why is it really, I really hated episode? it, too. Five, by the way. <laughs> I liked that episode. They I guess... parody um, the conditions under which anime is made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was unsexful. I gave it a D on Anime News Network, oh, and gosh. Peter liked it. Yep. What does that say about me, I guess? Um... <laughs> All right. Uh, well, different, different, yeah. different comedic tastes, I anyway. guess, in that 
I kind of liked the the twist with the villain. I just thought it was, I don't know, it, it was like he was a, kind of a non-villain. I, I think that was maybe the best part of the show because all the, all the romance stuff was really problematic with all like the, you know, uh, Sakuyo and then the other girls. Uh, I can't remember what their Prisma. I don't remember their names. Yeah, team, the, uh, the Prisma yeah. idols. Um, the girl with silver hair was um, predatory towards the girl with gold hair. Was, was she predatory? Yes, there were two different different situations. Okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it was, it was the same dynamic where it was just like the the kind of hopeless het, and then the other girl who loved her, who mm-hmm. was just probably wasting her time. I just can't believe that happened twice. That yeah. there's these two idol groups. One girl, one girl is gay for the other girl, and shows it in a very uncomfortable way. And Okay, so and they just here's did it what again? bothers me about Magical yeah. Girl. Or I, I did go in with some expectations, Peter. I thought oh. it was going to play with gender in an interesting way. I, I mean, when they could turn into Magical Girls, they turn into men. And that changes the way the world sees them. That changes the way they see themselves and the way they see each other. I thought that was going to have implications for their relationships. And it really didn't. After a while, characters stopped being shocked that the ma- that magical girls turn into men. That's just a thing. At first, people were very surprised. They're like, wait, magical girls are men? And later, it's like, oh, yeah, they're magical girls. See? Look at the muscles. And the implications about, about their dicks and stuff. And Ugh. so that was what was disappointing to me. They had the potential to say something interesting about gender. And they kind of just left that on the table. Additionally, I felt that Magical Girl Ori fell into the trap that a lot of parodies do, where it was trying to parody something and became the thing it was trying to parody. Even with the villain turning out to be kind of a non-villain, just the arc of the ending turned out to be very uh, formulaic for a Magical Girl series to me. I, I, hmm. There were so many things left on the table. I, I really wanted to know who Cyborg Fujimoto was, how... Um, Saki's parents fell in love, what her dad's connection to cyborgs was. There there was just a lot that they left. They wrapped up exactly as much as they could get away with wrapping up. True. I, I never really saw anything that made me think that it would, like, do it, anything it was trying to do very, I don't want to say intelligently, but I don't know if it was making an effort to do that so much as just kind of joking around. Um, I do get what you're saying where it kind of, like, became the thing it was parodying my optimism destroyed me you're saying yeah probably (laughs) i i think i get where you came from lauren though because i really went i went into it with i i got three episodes in i went into it with zero expectations figured i would maybe make it through the first episode and i actually like despite some despite a few kind of cringeworthy moments in terms of it's being very bad about gender stuff i actually thought the first episode was 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 wacky fun that was and vry wrote about this too in uh in their premiere review they were like i'm sort of tentatively hopeful this feels like it could just be kind of a wacky, like, gender comedy, which, you know, as long as those as long as long those don't get mean-spirited, I was like, they can be kind of fun. And that was kind of where I was hoping it would be. And then within, like, within, like, the next episode, and that first episode, like, there were so obviously characters who were, like, the like the older guy who was crushing on Saki when she was in, like, her, you know, masculine form, and then, like, you knew her... I'm, I might be getting the names wrong here, so sorry about that. And then, like, you knew her friend had a crush on her, and so it was like, well, maybe the, the show will go some fun places with that. Within the next, I think, episode and a half basically it was like oh no we're gonna go with um predatory lesbians and molestation jokes and and then i was i was deeply disappointed because i was like oh no this show is just really really mean um and that was kind of that was why i dropped it as early as i did so i get where you're coming from lauren in terms of um i thought it was like mean it, to the viewer there were a lot of jokes yeah. that were like did you really think we'd do that or who asked for this in the script and it just felt insulting. Yeah, I remember there was one where Saki's mom and the fairy, Kokoro, are um, moaning at each other, and there's imagery of a train going into a tunnel. No. And then they they widen out to show them giving each other back massages or whatever. It doesn't matter, but they're like, wow, I can't believe you guys assumed that. Or what, what an idiotic thing to put in the script. I mean, I guess it was very silly, 
But I, I didn't ask them to put that in the script, and they're just making fun of me watching it. Yeah, I think I think when it hit the tentacle scene uh, where Sakuyo declared her love for Saki, and then Saki was mm-hmm. just like, well, that makes me uncomfortable. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, well, that's not going to go anywhere. And she her while she was changing. Yeah. They never do anything with the Mojito thing where they, he seems yeah. to be attracted to her in her male form either. Mojito just continues to not be a person. And that becomes a joke, actually, where he never speaks. He just makes, like, these weird gasping noises and then the series translates for him yeah he has no voice yeah it's just and i guess he actually loses his voice in the end which is i don't know if that's like supposed to be a second level joke because he never really talked in the first place but i guess now he can't sing or something i guess i i liked the the villain subplot i thought it was kind of funny that he was like a creamy mommy fan who wanted to he came to our world to find magical girls didn't find any and then created his own and wanted them to be successful idols, but like I, I just didn't, I didn't have expectations for the other parts of the series, so I found something to like. I guess is the difference. Yeah. So overall, it doesn't sound like this would be a recommendation. Like Peter, it sounds like you kind of enjoyed it, but um, not necessarily something you would recommend to our listeners. I think I found something to enjoy about it, but I really can't think of I can't think of a person who that kind of thing is really who would who would that would appeal to. I guess that sounds mm-hmm. really damning. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I can't imagine a scenario where I would go, oh, you should check out Magical Girl. <laughs> I actually put it as my worst of the season. Ooh, wow. For, an, for the Anime News Network roundup. I, I could see that, especially because you had to watch it every week. Like, if I, if I had been forced to, to continue watching that show, I, I probably would have put it there, too. So I get that for sure. The next one I want to touch on real quickly, it looks like Lauren and I did our best with it and then just kind of fell off. Uh, Kakudio, Bed and Breakfast for Spirits. Um, I got about seven episodes in. I didn't dislike it. I just couldn't care at a certain point. And I've been really busy this, this, uh, I almost said year because it's been a long spring. <laughs> and so it was kind of just one of those where I kept looking at it going, I could go back and then going, no, I'm just not invested. And I ended up dropping it because of that. Um, what about you, Lauren? It looks like you got about five episodes in. Yeah, it had a good intro. I love stuff about cooking. And of course, uh, the main character was a very good cook and surrounded by mm-hmm. handsome supernatural men. But mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's there's a lot to choose from if if you want that kind of that kind of story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. And yeah, to me, Kakuryo, it's one of those where I'd be tempted to see what the manga was like because I don't know if part of it is just maybe it was just kind of blandly ad- adapted. Yeah, I reached a point where um, I always I was always down for seeing what Aoi was up to and some of the friends she made at the end. And then anytime her like fiance, I guess, showed up, I just I was like, oh boy, I really don't care about this relationship. Yeah, and it was it was a weird power dynamic there. Yeah, it was kind of it was an uncomfortable her. dynamic. Sorry, what? He kind of owned her, right? She was trying to pay off a debt, yeah. so I guess it was kind of, yeah, indentured servitude, maybe. Um, and then if she, and then like if she couldn't make her, I don't know, it was, again, it's it's a supernatural romance, so it was kind of inherently problematic, as a lot of them often are. But um, some of them will make it work within the premise, and like, I thought this one did a good job of making sure Aoi was, um, you know, very capable, very independent, um, she stood up for herself. Um, I liked her, I just felt like the show wanted me to get into her romance with the dude, and it never earned it for me. I found him, at best, boring, and at worst, like... Yeah. It's, Unlikable. It has, like, the shortfalls of, like, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. I think that, but I, again, I think there are, I think sometimes those stories, like, like again, obviously there's kind of an inherent issue in those stories, um, which, again, I think we talked about in the premiere review as well. So you kind of have to work extra hard to get people to, like, you know, be, go in for that relationship. I think there are ways to do it. I think Kakurio thought it was doing that. Like, it seemed to just assume that I was going to be on board with this relationship without ever really putting in what, what the legwork to get me to, to go, oh, I could see this. She was a really, like, spunky heroine, really, a real yeah. self-starter. Yeah. And sometimes that can be enough to be like, oh, look how capable she is. But yeah, just, I don't know, it just didn't really work for me. Kind of sounds like you were in the same boat. Mm-hmm. So, which is too bad. I had that happen a lot this season. This season was a little bit disappointing for me because there were a lot of shows I thought I was going to be into, and then they kind of fell off um, along the way about halfway through. So, fortunately, the next one on this list was not one of those. This one was a happy surprise. Uh, Yotsugiro Biori, or as I like to call it, Laid Back Cafe. Uh, Lauren, you finished this one too. Yeah. yeah I mean, how could I not? <laughs> yeah. What What are your thoughts on this one? Everything about it should have been boring. I mean, it's just four guys. <laughs> they're cute and they cook. And, mm-hmm. and 
but it was just so calming and so comfortable to come back to every week. I think it had a really good sense of humor too, which mm -hmm. always helps me. Like a lot of those, if an, if like an Ayashike like healing style show is going to keep me, it's usually because the humor is really good. Like otherwise I, otherwise I'll start to lose interest. Cause like you said, like nothing really happened. They had clients, they had customers who came in and sometimes they had problems and they'd help them with their problems. And sometimes we'd get backstory episodes and it was really just like day to day living at, at this um, charming little Japanese tea house with these, these four good boys and their cat. Don't forget. And their wonderful and their wonderful cat who they loved very much. And it was just it was just nice. It was just like yeah, it was like a refreshing cool breeze once a week um that I knew I there were never I don't think there were ever any anything in it that I would consider like a caveat for our listeners. Um can you think of anything on your end? Oh, yeah, not at all. I was just thinking yeah. of when the aunt and her daughter go there because they saw it as a review. And I'm like this mm -hmm. site would be nothing less than 5 stars on Yelp. This site, this cafe. Heck yeah. Well, you know, there's always that one person who's like, no, I'm going to give it a one star review because it was really far from my house. One star. Yeah, actually, that's the only way to review this show. Like if I had been doing it weekly for Anime News Network, I would have given it my weekly Yelp review. <laughs> that would have been great. I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, but it, again, it was one of those where I, I didn't have to worry about it each week, which was really nice. Um, and it, it existed in this in this world that I, I wanted to live in where like, I mean, the main characters, like we said, are, are these sort of like handsome, good looking boys. I think this thing runs young men, I should say. I think this ran in a Jose magazine initially. So, you know, it, it is kind of it is kind of appealing to young ladies in that uh, regard. But I thought they did a really good job of having a lot of like female characters who would move in and out of the story. And I want to say, like, other than the high school kids, obviously, I think they were all, like, career women who were working hard at their jobs and were coming to the cafe to, like, get a break. God, I loved the arc with the middle-aged guy who, like, loves sweets and cute stuff mm -hmm. and is extremely moe and just respects his 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 lady boss so much. Um, and I loved that that uh, Roku, that Yotsuri Biori existed in that, in that very, like, kind of low-key, progressive, like, world that I also would like to live in. Um, more and more nowadays. I loved when the boys were reading shoujo manga. That was so cute. I forgot about that. They all got super into it. Um, I was like, heck yeah. That's how, that's how they get you. Yeah, it's just, it was just a really nice little slice of life comedy. And I appreciated it every week, I think. Sounds like you kind of did too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was nice. This is one I I've, I recommended this in our um in our actual like write up recommendations post too, and so I will say it again for the listeners. Yotsuya Biori definitely recommended. Um, next up on the list, uh, Sword Art Sword Art Online alternate alternative. God, this title is long. Gun Gale Online. Uh, Peter, you finished this one? Yep. Well, I mean, the last episode just came out today, so I'm gonna watch it, but. I've kept up with it, yeah. Oh, my fault. I, I, we, I guess we could have scheduled this differently. Well, barring, barring it completely face planting in the ending. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, there's really only one ending that the two of them fight. Len wins, and then they meet in real life. That's, that's what's gonna happen. Peter's calling it now, folks. He hasn't seen it, just so you know. Literally, the only thing um, that could happen. But uh, it's not a spoiler. It's a prediction. Well, if Len loses at this point, it's gonna be like bad ending because that means. Uh, Pito's gonna kill herself in real life, so that'll be bad. Oh God! Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind sounds of a, like Gun Gale got intense. Uh, a little bit. I mean, I, I think it's really fun. It's probably the funnest thing that Sig Sauer has written that wasn't directed by uh, one of the greatest anime directors of all time. I don't think it's really done anything bad, and it's it's a lot of combat stuff. So if you're not into combat stuff, this probably won't appeal. Uh, it's basically just a lot of girl gamers fighting each other in sword art. And, or mm -hmm. I guess in this case, the Gun Gale Online game in the Sword Art universe, they make some references to Sword Art proper, and it's just this weird, I guess, death pact kind of thing. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the Pito Hui is obviously this idol that Len likes. They meet online, have no idea who each other are in real life. Uh, I think Pito mm -hmm. Hui figures out who Len is because she wrote a fan letter to, uh, the idol, who is the player of Pito Hui, and, uh, I guess Pito Hui's a little crazy. I'm, I'm, I think that's the point I'm like most looking, hoping that they do something with, uh, since she's an idol, and it seems like she has a lot of trouble with real life. Uh, it mm -hmm. kind of implied that she's not really able to keep up uh, with, like, you know, being that cute, innocent, chaste kind of image that all Japanese idols have. Mm -hmm. And so she goes to Gun Gale Online to shoot people, go nuts, and have fun. And I think I, she's, she's, there's something else there too. Like I think she's maybe depressed or something like that. Uh, she ha had the original Sword Art Online but didn't log in before everybody got trapped in the game uh, and kind of wishes she had been trapped 
because that <laughs> it was like a life or death situation and that would have mm-hmm. been exciting. Um, so now she's decided that she's going to be in this, it's called the Squad Jam, where it's like this battle royale in Sword Online, or Gun Girl, sorry. Gun Girl, uh, yeah. yeah. And if she dies, she's going to kill herself in real life or something like that. But she made a promise to Len earlier that if Len ever kills her, she'll they'll meet in real life. Uh, so Len says she's going to kill her before anybody else can so that she doesn't kill herself and she can they can meet and talk about it or something like that. And that's the plot. Uh, that got very intense. Yeah, um, Pito Hui is pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah, I got that sense. I, I, I caught two or three episodes of this. It didn't really do anything for me. Um, so I, I kind of let it fall by the wayside. Um, I did see some screenshots, and maybe you can speak to this. Are there canonical queer characters in this? Because I saw some people on Twitter getting very excited about that, but sometimes Twitter treats headcanon as, like, yeah. canonical representation, and I just want to, like, I don't want our listeners to go into this, like, expecting something that's maybe maybe there, but, you know, very kind of, like, implicit, um, which is also fine, but, like, yeah, what what's what's the... Um... I, I have seen Twitter calling it the, like, lesbian death pact anime or something like that, <laughs> um, but uh-huh. really, there it seems more like friendship between Pito Hui and Len. Uh, Len's mm-hmm. friend, Fukuzero, kind of makes a lot of jokes to that effect, like, uh, at one point, it, Len's going to die, but then she comes in on an armored carrier and pricks her up and then just says, like, she just, like, talks a lot of shit. She goes, like, hey, cutie, you think this world has love hotels or something like that? And then they drive off. So she kind of acts like a, a handsome guy picking up mm-hmm. a girl in her – she was, like, pretending she was driving a sports car instead of a, a military jeep or something like that. Yeah, I gotcha. So, she so jo- there's, there's she undertones, like but not necessarily um, – mostly treated – it sounds like it's mostly kind of treated as, like, just kind of for fun. Uh, yeah. In fact, does the only references sense? to romance really are uh, M does love Pito Hui, although you don't know if that's reciprocated. Mm-hmm. And while he's talking to her, he gets kind of emotional. And I, I think she's going to walk away. So he stops her by Kabedoning her. And mm. then uh, Len kind of thinks regretfully that her first Kabedon was from a guy who was talking about how he loved another girl. So that was that was like the one reference to any kind of romance in the series. Basically, besides that, it's just girls having fun playing video games. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, if you like that, and it sounds like it's it sounds like it's definitely shippable. Again, based on kind of what folks have what I've seen on the Twitter. So I wanted to kind of get your take on that too um, before we moved on to um, last period again. Peter, you're going to be the only one talking about this. I got a few episodes in and dropped off on this one as well. Dang. Um, but you finished it and liked it a lot, didn't you? Yeah, I thought it was really fun. Mobile game anime are getting weird, man. <laughs> this one, I I don't... It, it said c- the story continues in the mobile game at the end of the last episode. Um, but it had a good ending, so that's fine. Um, but I'm wondering if this is actually the story in the mobile game, because if it is, that is just absolutely insane. It's these... Characters going around to fight spirals, but they're not really fighting spirals. They're fighting these Team Rocket wannabes called Wise Man. Mm-hmm. But they're not even really fighting Wise Man. They're mostly just making anime and video game references and kind of in a very cynical touch and cheek way where they're talking about the ways that the industry can be really, really, really shitty. There's one episode where uh, they randomly get rich in one episode, and then two episodes later, two of them have spent all their money, but Haru, the main character, still has all his money. And they're in a fight with wise man and he can't get a good pull from their like gotcha person and he spends literally like enough fortune to like they bought a couple mansions each and that's how the other guys ran out of money he spends all Mm -hmm. of that money trying to get a single five star and has a nervous breakdown oh my Uh, god yeah and uh they have a hot springs episode where the uh, episode they're trying to like save the hot springs so choco yeah i saw that one yeah kind of made me roll my eyes uh, you didn't like that one? I thought it was funny. Well, I liked, I thought the 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 joke about like how our tourism town isn't getting enough people, so we should just set an anime here so people will come out to it for like the anime like tie-in events. Um, I thought that was pretty clever. Um, there were some there were some pretty decent like little jabs within that, but it did that thing that a lot of shows do that irritates me, where it's like we're gonna call out the fan service so that when we put in the fan service, you know that we don't really mean it. And I'm like, no, but you're yeah. still shoving boobs in my face. Like you're still sexualizing these characters just because you know that's what you're doing doesn't make it not fan service. Yeah. So, and I almost find that I think I find that more obnoxious than than like just the sort of people going, yeah, no, that's what this is. It's a fan service show because at least then you're upfront about it. Yeah, and in other episodes they just had the fan service without the tongue in cheek, so they didn't even go that far. So I, I did. I, I wrote that in my uh, end of season thing that. Yeah. It, that's that was probably its biggest failing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I I don't I thought a lot of the jokes landed pretty well. There was a Kimono Friends mm-hmm. episode where I guess the cute Kimono friend was a a boy who was really cute and they were trying to 
make him quit so that they could fill his job with attractive girls uh, to drive tourism, even though the boy was driving tourism. So they mobilized uh, everybody democratically, got people to sign a petition, and eventually pressured the mayor to go back on the decision to fire this tour guide, uh, which I thought was <laughs> just... What? What is this show about? I... I couldn't tell you. It's every episode. I you is said a, it was a, a phone thing. game, like a mobile yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. It's a mobile game. It's based on a mobile game. It's um, it's basically like a fantasy story about like these lovable losers who are trying to like save up money. Is the is essentially the pres- the yeah. premise. So they go out on like missions to different towns to try to like help them fight these monsters called spirals. Um, yeah, I mean, but that's I got really that just part, but... yeah. No, that's just that's just like window dressing almost um it's really just every episode from what i can tell is an excuse to parody something yeah there was an entire episode that parodied higurashi yep. higurashi which came out like 15 years ago yeah, but it's still so good now um, i kind of want to watch this because this sounds this sounds so bizarre just listening to you talk about it i yeah. do actually recommend it it's really good yeah it's it's pretty wild from the episodes i saw i kind of enjoyed it and i just again i had a lot on my plate and it it fell by the wayside but it was it was one that i i could have seen myself going back to so um yeah no last period is is a pretty wacky comedy yeah. i think would be a good way to describe it so i say there's like three fan service episodes but the rest of it is actually really clean there's three episodes where they do a lot, um, but then the rest of it, they uh, seem to be avoiding it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a little hit or miss, but mostly hit. Cool. Yeah. Um, we still have a lot to talk about, um, so I do kind of want to just keep us moving here. Um, this next one we've all seen, so I feel like we'll probably chat about it for a bit. Uh, Hina Matsuri. Yeah, this was one of my favorite of the season. Same here. Um, I I looked forward to this one every week. Maybe the show I looked forward to the most every week. I I, I laugh pretty regularly when I'm watching comedies, um, but it's like chuckles. Hina Matsuri had me like cackling almost once a week. Like the timing of the jokes, the facial expressions, like everything about it just comes the framing of it just it came together perfectly. Like it's just a really, really well made comedy. And yeah, I, I adored it. Um Peter? Pretty much same. I came into the season not thinking that anything would even get near Golden Kamui, but uh, yeah, Hinamatsuri, definitely a, a competition for the number one spot for me. I just, yeah, uh, basically what you said, just like a really supremely well put together comedy series. It did a lot of unique stuff. The animation was way better than it had any right to be. Like it, it was better than it ever needed to be to yeah. execute any of the jokes. They just, it just had that, it was like icing on the cake. And I've, I've never seen a comedy series that I think deserved a second season more, especially with the way they yeah. left it off. It almost felt like they were trying to set up a sequel, which I am now praying happens. I thought there would be a season two announcement at the end, like with the way they ended it. So um, I think they're hopeful. And I, I don't know how well it, it it's doing as far as numbers go, like um, DVD sales and things, but Fingers crossed. Um, the manga has been licensed by One Piece Books. Um, I think the first volume comes out in like August. So if folks are interested in uh, more Hina Matsuri, we do have we do have that um, available in English pretty quick here, which is great. Yeah, I guess we should. It, it we put it in our yellow flags, and I think we for the season Rex. I think we all listed it as a problematic fave. It's not like perfect. It's got it's it's so hard to describe Hina Matsuri because I feel like when I explain it to somebody, it sounds like it's going to be really bad. But the way it's put together it just, mitigates mitigates any yeah. of the potential issues. It walks Does that this make very sense? like fine line, doesn't it? Like if it were if it teeters a little to one side, it would be downright offensive. If it teeters to the other side, it's just this depressing show about everything that's wrong with the world. But somehow it was in the middle and managed to be funny and even heartwarming sometimes. Yeah, I so I, I said this in, in a tweet like three episodes in, and I think I think there were some episodes that pushed against this a little bit more than I had expected, but overall I think it kind of held true. There's this sense of like the adults are all kind of a mess and they're all kind of selfish and irresponsible, but you don't really get the sense that any of them have like genuinely ill intent. Like, I mean, this is a show where you've got like a bunch of 12-year-olds hanging out with Yakuza and um, living in a homeless community and like these these situations that would in real life, you know, probably be very dangerous. And because of the way the show presents them, it's it's sort of like inappropriate, but ultimately kind of harmless. Like you feel you feel okay laughing about it because you know that the girls are never like in any genuine danger. Like sexual assault doesn't exist in this world. Like there are the kids worry about it, but the adults like it's never even crosses anybody's mind. And it's one of those things that I don't think I realized how much I needed that in a 
in a comedy like this until it happened because so often that happens and it just sours the experience. Like, oh, now, now, now there's a genuine threat and now I'm not having fun anymore. So like, you know, when um, Hitomi ends up in a bar by herself and the response is, hey, you should just make me a drink. And she's like, well, I don't know how. And the guy's like, I'll teach you how to make a drink. And that's the, that's the comedy. It's perfect. Like that, you know, you, you feel okay laughing about that because it's not like anyone's in like genuine danger from that. Yeah, there are actual, like, ne- like life and death experiences in this show. Like, survival situations. Mm-hmm. And yet, mm-hmm. they still come across as light and funny. It helps that most of the girls have superpowers. Yeah, so, that's true. You know that you know that worse comes to worse, they can they can kind of like explode anybody. But there's there's again there's never really that there's never really that fear or that genuine threat. Um, and I think that I think that helps make the the kind of inappropriate humor. Um, it keeps everything very light, which I I really appreciated that about it. It's I think it it runs in like a seinen. So some of the stuff in it where I'm like, well, I wouldn't necessarily want a kid to know about that. It, it the show it's not. It's not a series that's targeted at like 12 year olds, you know, it's targeted at like an older audience to kind of giggle about like, oh, look at these goofy, irresponsible adults and these and these, you know, kids getting into scrapes kind of thing. And I think it I think it hits that that balance really, really well. Um, It's also sometimes like really sweet and heartwarming, like you said, Um, and it it swings between the two modes um, very deftly, I think. Yeah, I think it's even smarter for that reason. Like there's a lot of. Uh, I'll, I'll use a volleyball analogy. Uh, they, uh, you know, where the the one player sets it up for the other one to spike it. Yeah. They do that with like jokes where the the girls would like any any sort of setup for a joke where a girl's about to be sexualized or you're going to endanger a twelve year old. But instead of spiking the ball, they just do something completely unexpected and you start laughing. Then you start to trust the series for that reason because like early on you're just like oh like there's like three or four situations even in the first episode where they could have sexualized Tina or she's like going into this dangerous situation you think the series is about to get dark then they just take a u-turn do something completely unexpected with it and it's just so funny and you realize that they could have done the easy thing but they didn't do that no they went better for it yeah they went the like full silly like yeah they they swerved um and went for something kind of different and yeah I spent that I, I reviewed the first episode and I spent the whole time like on like kind of constantly tense like waiting for that shoe to drop and then it never did and I was like this is great Yep. I'm having a very good time. I kept it up. So, yeah, I, I appreciate the um, the kind of wacky family hijinks um, that goes on in that show. Um, and it sounds like we all did. And, yeah, like I said, it's not it's not perfect. Like if like if the, you know, if minors in peril, I think it's how Rye worded it. Um, if that's something that, you know, is going to bother you no matter what, then, you know, stay away from it. But I think it I think it balances its elements in such a way that um, you can go in and just and just laugh and have a good time. Uh, okay, so the next one, uh, Lauren, I saw you just you just put a little check mark in this box. Uh, Guns and Build Divers, you're watching that one? Yes, and I will be watching it until the end, but that doesn't necessarily mean I would recommend it to everyone. Definitely, Yikes. if you're a hardcore Gundam fan, you should be watching it because there are it, there are really deep cuts in the references <laughs> to older shows. In fact, mm-hmm. I I have a column on my site for Gundam fans, Gunpla101.com, that's just about Mm -hmm. pointing out all of that. I have Tom Asnable, Tom Asnable on Mm -hmm. Twitter, writing that. But you asked me before this podcast if I would recommend it to you as someone who liked Gundam Build Fighters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not not sure I would at, at this point because what was great about Gundam Build Fighters is it had... Um, this really powerful drive on behalf of its characters. They, mm-hmm. Like, the main character really wanted to catch up with his dad and become the best um, build fighter. And here the plot is, we've got the this bland protagonist who's interested and excited about exploring an MMORPG about Gundam. That's the whole story, really. Is that it's like, let's see what kind of cool things there are to do in this fictional game. So there's not really, it doesn't sound like there's really a narrative arc. It's more just kind of like episodic adventures. Yeah. And Mm. so if you're like a hardcore fan, you'll be watching it to see, oh, wow, they referenced that really old show. I feel seen. And (laughs) right, right now, and what's, but what's interesting is, you know, in the second half, which is going to continue this summer, Mm -hmm. It could get better because the villain is actually a guy who wishes we would go back to the world of Gundam Build Fighters. Oh, he's he's on he's unhappy with the change, just like a lot of um, viewers are like me, like the Mm -hmm. villain is very relatable. And that's a real twist that could 
change how I view the second half. So, you know, check in with me later. Yeah, for sure. I'll be curious to see uh, how it works out at the end and if it's something you'd recommend by the time you get to the, the finale because I did enjoy I enjoyed Build Fighters. I'm watching Try right now. I'm not liking it quite as much, but it's it's I'm, I'm still having fun with it. So I'll be curious to see if, if Divers ends up being something you think I should check out or not. Um, okay, and then I guess the next one... Okay, Peter, uh, guys, we... Uh, Listeners, we have um, like a chart where we just kind of marked what shows we were watching this season. Uh, the next one on my list is Gegege no Kitaro. Peter has written the letter D, and I don't know what that means. Drop. Okay. Well, I All would right, say dropped, so... stopped, maybe. I, I stopped watching it, I'm yeah. not against picking it up later. I just, again, it's just like Lupin. I kind of... Uh, there were a lot of shows. I fell off. Maybe I should have put an F for fell off. Yeah, I just, I just wasn't sure what that meant, so I thought I would double check there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I thought maybe you gave it a D. No, yeah, no, I was no, like no. harsh. I thought people were liking this one. Okay. Yeah, I, I like um, it pretty good. I think it's fun. Uh, it doesn't really have any problematic content. Um, it's got capers. Pretty good animation, all things considered. Mm-hmm. It's probably an anime. Could you show it to kids? I think so. I think it's that good kind of like, is that called child horror? I can't remember. It's kind of spooky stuff that kids can watch. Yeah, that was the sense I got from the first episode that it would be kind of a family friendly sort of uh ghost story yeah and there's action and jokes too so it's got a bunch of stuff to like level it out uh i Mm -hmm. i think it was a fun show um but um yeah just like lupon um there was a lot to keep up with this season so i had to make sacrifices yeah i think that i think that takes us out of the harmless fun category and into our um our kind of top groups here so as far as feminist potential goes we had a couple of shows here persona 5 the animation peter i think you're the only one of us who was watching that one too so sorry you have to keep talking okay on your own (laughs) i thought i was kind of disappointed early on because it didn't really do anything new with the series Mm -hmm. in fact it copied a lot like even more than it should have from the game Uh, Like, a lot of the fights literally just have, like, the in-game graphics where they do, like, the all-out attacks and stuff, which... I heard they they kept in some of the kind of shitty stuff, too, like, um... Uh, the, uh... The... Yeah. The predatory gay dudes, I believe, is how I would describe them. They left those in. Sure did. Yeah. Good job. I I was like, okay, well, if you're going to copy the game directly and not add stuff, at least you could take out the bad stuff. They didn't do that either. Yeah. Um, I did, I think near the end of the C series, they did include one scene that I'm pretty sure was anime original, uh, which was actually a scene between uh, Makoto and Anne, uh, where one of the things that drives Makoto to your group is Anne kind of calls her useless, uh, which is something that people have been doing to her for a long time. And she gets really pissed mm-hmm. off and ends up kind of doing something really reckless that drives a plot point and ends up getting her uh, at, to join the Phantom Thieves. Uh, mm-hmm. and th- that's kind of, it was, it was a good thing in the game, but, uh, in the anime, like later on, I guess, Anne felt bad about the thing she'd said when Makoto ended up being like a really, uh, what's it called? Useful member of the group, uh, like really mm-hmm. dedicated to the cause and everything. So they end up having a conversation later where she apologizes to her and then Makoto says, I think we're pretty similar. Um, and they kind of have like a talk about the bad things they said to each other and, and forgive each other and decide to be friends, uh, which I thought was a good scene. Um, so it's nice that yeah, they, that's a nice addition. I guess they, yeah, for the, the one good addition. Also, they made, uh, my favorite, uh, my OTP, the Canon OTP in the anime. <laughs> so I got to give it that. Um, but besides that, it's pretty much exactly the same as the game. Good opening. Okay. Yeah. So I guess game fans, uh, check it out. It's, it's hard. We, we've yet to have anyone talk about this anime who hasn't played the game, so we still don't know if it's, like, accessible if you aren't familiar with the game or not, but um, I guess maybe give it a try if it sounds okay to y'all. Yeah, I wonder that a lot. Uh, and it's it's running into... See, it's got its two core, right? It's running into the summer as well? I believe so. If... Okay. Yeah, I believe so. Well, if, if things, you know, take turns, uh, keep us posted in, in upcoming podcasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, next one. This was kind of a big... This was a big hit this season, and it looks like Lauren has not watched this one. Not so at all. Be, Sell me, me on it. it. Me and Peter. Well, here's the thing. The next one, folks, <laughs> is me- the next one is Mega Megalobox. Uh, Megalobox. Anyway, Megalobox. I Peter and I both finished it. Um, I know a lot of folks online were real high on it. Um, I think Peter and I are maybe in the minority here. We were sort of uh, underwhelmed by the finale. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how. Yeah. Again, it's one of those. I don't want to spoil things, but. Um, I feel like you have to because the bad part was it had a bunch of build up to nothing. The ending was like the bad part, right? I think what I think what kind of got me with uh, Megalobox with Megalobox is in the first like six episodes, it there were a lot of these sort of social commentary elements. Um, the yeah, main character is an undocumented citizen. Um, there's even there's even a little cru- uh, cross in his car that has um, 
uh, Spanish writing on it, or I guess it's in his trainer's car. Um, so it feels like they're drawing some connections as far as like immigrant populations and coming up from a place where you don't have much and how he's able to fight his way up. He doesn't wear the gear. So there's kind of this um, this element of like privilege and having to work your way up, you know, having that handicap. And then at the halfway point, he fights a guy who was in this like horrible war overseas, um, lost both of his legs, comes back, gets prosthetics, like, um, you know, fights his way back into the ring. And there's so there's a lot going on. Like I got to the midway point and I was like, I think this series is a commentary on America, even though I don't think it takes place in America. And then the second half is really just punch man punches other man. And it, so it, it, I felt like it was going to go someplace with all that stuff. And I didn't feel like it really did. And so I kept wondering if maybe I just missed something. So, you know, listeners, if you if you see the full if you see the full picture of uh, Megalobox, please let us know in the comments, because I would I would like to know if I'm missing something and if there's there's a way for me to appreciate this. But it felt like they just they threw a bunch of they threw it into the story more as window dressing than as something they were actually going to do anything with. And I ended up being um, kind of disappointed with it because of that. Yeah, I don't know. Even the aspects of the story that they included, not outside of setting, I I feel like were underserved. Like uh, Yukiko's subplot was just this confusing nothing. Uh, like she basically, I guess, existed to be betrayed by Yuri so that he could, uh, whatever her ambitious goal was, instead of doing that, uh, punch another guy because that was more important. But then maybe you find out that her ambitious goal was just getting a military contract while trying to maintain this absurd moral high ground that the gear that she's making is not a weapon, even though she's selling it to the military to be used as a weapon. Uh, like, wh- what the hell was any of that? Uh, were they trying to, like, uh, first of all, like, the, it was basically saying, like, yeah, you two had an agreement, but toxic masculinity is more important. Uh, but also, it, even, like, she's just being, I, I tweeted that, I guess she's Google. She's just trying to pretend she's, like, this freedom fighter who's just wants military contracts. Like, I, I, like what, what was her subplot? What was it supposed to be? What was its point besides just contributing bad stuff to the story yeah and they kept they kept framing it as like oh she had other things she wanted to do and she just had to get this first step done before she could move on to the others but we never there were a lot of i think very poorly defined subplots in the story like yukiko is obviously yuri correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think we ever really learned much about him no like i felt like I, i felt like i got to the finale and like in the last few episodes and they really wanted me to like be rooting for him as much as I was rooting for Joe. And I was like, I don't know anything about this guy. I don't, I, I have no idea other than that. He likes to fight. Like that's all I know. And so it made it really hard for me to, cause again, like in that middle arc where you meet, um, Oh gosh, what was his name? Oh shoot. I'm blanking. Um, the, the, the war vet who comes back, um, to boxing, like you get so much of his backstory and his motivation and his, and his history. And like that, those fights were really good because I kind of ended up cheering for both of them. Yeah, that's true. He, he got like, I felt I was like more supportive of him than I was of Yuri. I didn't know who Yuri was, but I knew who that guy was and why he was fighting. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So we get to the final arc and it's like, they just expect me to give a damn about Yuri. And I'm like, I really don't, I don't, I don't understand your motivation for teaming up with, uh, with Shirato in the first place. And now I don't understand. I kind of understand why you're pulling back from that, from that, because like you really want to punch this guy, I guess. Um, but I don't get, I don't know enough about your history to know like why that would be, important to you as opposed like I again I know enough about Joe I understand like like how Joe I understand Joe's history and why he is motivated to um to get in the ring and why he does what he does and I I don't I don't know with Yuri and then again that same thing with Yukiko it felt like there was more there that just got left on the cutting room floor maybe but it made the final it made the final arcs um fall kind of kind of flat for me um, I mean, I kind of, I, I do love, I love that the internet has decided that Joe and uh, Yuri are a couple now. Um, I think there's, I think there's enough in story because Peter, I told you afterwards, I was like, um, I was like, is this a love story? Because if this is a love story, I can, I guess I can kind of get behind it. But that's the only way I can read this in a way that, that makes me, that makes it kind of resonate because otherwise I'm just not really sure. Again, I mean, maybe I missed something. Listeners, please let me know. I would love to appreciate this show more than I did. Um, and maybe I'm just, maybe because of the way I watched it, I missed something. So I, Yeah, I agree. That's probably the best read on the ending. Even the, <laughs> how did you and dad get together? Oh, he put me in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Punched uh, him so hard his spine snapped. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Megalo Box was, I mean, it was, I think the first half was really, really good. And yeah. then I just, I just don't think it had enough. 
it either didn't have enough time or it had too much time. I'm not sure. Um, but I don't think they spent as much time on the elements that were there early on in the final. And so it kind of fell a bit flat for both of us. It Tragic. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Which is tough. So I ended up not recommending it and I thought I would. Um, but oh, well, again, uh, I know a lot of other folks who liked it. So if you like sports anime, um, I would say give it a try. And um, maybe somebody can pitch us an article that will uh, that will defend the show. Watch Hajime no Ippo instead is my recommendation. Yeah. Um, so that kind of brings us, I feel kind of bad about this. I put major second in these upper categories and then none of us watched it. Um, because it just, it was, it was more of a kid's show. And I think we just, none of us were really drawn to the baseball series. So we won't chat about that. But again, listeners, let us know if you watched it and how, how it turned out. Um, Lauren, you did finish Wotakoi. Love is hard for an otaku, right? Yes. And I recommend it too. I, I liked it a lot. I'm surprised you guys weren't watching it. Is it because it's behind the Amazon paywall? No, I've I've got I have um it's not called Strike anymore. I have whatever it's called. I just blanked. Amazon on the name. Prime. Um, yeah, I have it's Prime. Prime now, yeah. yeah, I you know I I tried it. My thing with Voltakoi, and I I will go over this real quick because I don't really want to yuck anybody's yums. Like I don't I don't think I have anything. I don't have anything like really against it. My thing with it is I felt like the characters were kind of just cardboard cutouts that you were intended to self insert yourself into as as like a as a nerd, and. If you didn't like map exactly onto that character, then there was really no way to to connect with them. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but I I just I I they didn't feel like fully fleshed out individuals um, for me, and so I got three episodes in and I kind of got annoyed with it and just it just just wasn't working for me at all, so I dropped it. Uh, but you liked it all the way through, so please uh, tell us tell us about it. Sure. I mean, I was excited for this even before it aired because I saw that it was one of the most popular things on Pixiv as a manga mm-hmm. by a rookie author, by someone who was just like, I'm going to draw this in my spare time. So I, I was really excited to see what was created, you know, outside of like the writer's room. Just, uh-huh. just somebody in their house. And I thought there were a lot of um, hallmarks of this really genuine, authentic fandom that the creator was trying to insert in there. And it was merged with this very polished look, the way that each character is kind of color-coded and stuff. And mm-hmm. the animation was just very smooth. I, I love the opening sequence. I've seen that um, gift so many times. Oh, the opening's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the opening a lot. Yeah, but basically it is two followed... First, there's two followed by a third heterosexual couple, and mm-hmm. they're geeks. That's what makes them. That's what makes it unique. But other than that, I mean, it's pretty much standard stuff. And really, when you see queer stuff, it's just uh, in a fetishized version. Like the two yeah. main female characters are always arguing which of their boyfriends would be a better top um, in a BL relationship. Mm. Yeah, there's no that space for queerness a outside bit. of outside of BL. <laughs> Yeah, I saw some screenshots, and I know one of the guys is really into Yuri too. Um, yeah, he's into Moe. Okay, maybe the maybe the screenshots were again. I I I didn't watch too far into. It. No, he was buying he was buying Yuri Yuri volumes in like volume oh, okay. in like episode two. Yeah, I know so. that um, one of the girls is was really into uh, Hajimete My Hero, which was not a great BL series. I don't think mm-hmm. any of us would recommend that or. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, yeah, and I guess that was that was kind of my thing with watching it was I it for me it, the characters felt kind of stereotyped and in very broad strokes in the sense of like oh well the girls are into BL and cosplay because all girl geeks are into BL and cosplay obviously and the boys were into video games and Yuri because you know that's 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 the that's the nerdy stuff boys are into and then like like the one guy was and and maybe this got better it's very possible this got better and it was just my it was just kind of my my impatience with the first three episodes um, but then it would be things like you know you had the one guy who was really into video games I have friends who are really into video games they're not into every video Video game. They're into, you know, uh, RPGs or strategy games or, you know, maybe a couple of different genres, but not every single thing. Like they have no interest in shooters, but they really like these other kinds of games. And with the gamer, like this is kind of my sort of bulk example. It was like, oh, no, he just likes all games. And I was like, I can't I can't connect to that character because that's not my experience with like actual nerds. It, again, it, it felt to me like you were supposed to self insert into one of these people. Um, and I didn't, so that was, that was my struggle with it. Mm -hmm. I think over time they become, they, they develop these character beats. Like I love the, the episode where they all go to the amusement park and Mm -hmm. the two characters who are, are afraid of scary rides end up 
getting stuck in the car together while the two characters who are just totally calm and having a normal conversation behind them are in the car together. Mm-hmm. And you start to see what makes each of these characters unique. Okay, that's good. I'm I'm glad to hear that I'm glad to hear that their personalities get get further fleshed out as the series goes. Uh, so Lauren, do you think you would recommend Wotakoi to our uh, listeners then? Uh, yeah, I think it doesn't really go above and beyond in being a feminist fave, but I don't think there's anything that people would find offensive. Well, other than the fetishization of oh, of um, course, yes, queer fiction. But, yeah, uh, which I mean, I you, you it mentioned was fun so. as a character-based comedy sitcom, really. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you liked it. I know Caitlin enjoyed it too. Um, she she's she's talked about it periodically as well. So we definitely got some staffers who enjoyed it, which is nice. Um, the next one on the list, I can keep this real short. I'm the only person who got even a little bit into it. Uh, Libra of Neil Admirari. It was the uh, season's Otome adaptation. Um, I am the resident Otome apologist, and uh, I couldn't finish this one. So uh, that says something. I was I was kind of into it. It was sort of blandly put together, but um, I kind of the central story was really um, kind of neat and interesting to me as ter- in terms of like possessed bo- like cursed books that possess people and like the power of like fiction and and how that works and you know whether you should. Like there's there's these undertones about like oh this story has given people bad ideas so we should burn the book and the main character like no we need to preserve these it's not the book's fault kind of thing, and um, so there were kind of some these sort of neat elements and then there ended up being some intrigue and some competing factions and I was like yeah I can get into this, and then right around episode six they had a um, sort of a one shot episode about one of the supporting characters that featured a um, the the supporting character was a writer. And it featured a fan, an obsessed fan, who was murdering people as to, like, it was, oh, God, what was the... Basically, the writer had written a murder mystery about um, a woman who was murdering her, like, the guy she liked, suitors, so um, eventually he would um, only be with her and, like, become obsessed with her, and, like, that's how she would win, is because he would always think about her. And so this was this, like, horror story he wrote. Well, one of his obs- one of his obsessed fans ends up, like, enacting this in real life, and it turns out the fan is, I guess, a trans woman? Either a trans woman or a gay man dressed in, dressed in women's clothing. It's not clear because it's very poorly done. It's, like, it was, it was a, just, just the worst possible, like, evil, evil queer person stereotype. Like, the way they drew the character was caricatured and awful and I didn't like the show that much so there was not enough there to get me to uh work through that so I dropped it like a hot potato and I never came back and that's Libra of Neil Admirari damn I have nothing else that I feel like I need to say about that one I felt like uh going in I was probably more interested in that one than I am in most Atome, but yeah I I, I lost after a couple episodes <laughs> it had a glad it had a cool up. premise yeah yeah it, it had a cool plum- premise bland characters and then it did something oh real bad and I was done so that yeah sucks uh, next one on the list, though, we can all talk about. This was our, um, ended up, we don't really rank them like one, two, three, but it ended up being our top series because it started with the highest level letter in the alphabet. Um, and this was Golden Kamui. Yeah. I've been talking for a while. Y'all can lead this conversation. Man, I can't believe I slept on it for three weeks. And just people were still raving about it. So I was like, oh, I got to watch this. And I'm so glad I did. And see, I kind of did the opposite. I watched the first three was having a hard time getting into it. I couldn't figure out what it was, I think, as far as like what the show wanted to be. And I ended up basically dropping it. And I was like, well, I'll check out the manga because the production values were kind of killing me in the early episodes as well. And then I decided to just kind of go back to it on a whim and got completely sucked up into it. So yeah, I can't believe I almost dropped it. So I am with you on that one for sure, Lauren. I knew. Well, because I read you'd the been, manga. So. You read the manga. Well, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I was like, oh, I'll check out the manga for sure. I just... Those CG bears, y'all. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think they were they got that me. bad. I mean, I guess they it's because really I, I heard about the CG bears before I saw them. It was in the yeah. PV. Uh, yeah, I was like, this isn't a surprise, guys. Shut up. Uh, I, I, I was actually kind of angry that people were only talking about the bear when there was so much else to talk about. <laughs> that well, it was like, there's good stuff. Yeah, I truthfully, I thought the production values were... I mean, the, the team doing the show obviously cares about it a lot, and I do not mean this as like... Um, as like a slight against them, like, oh, they're so lazy or anything like that. They're, I think, a new studio, and I think they picked a very action-heavy, detailed series to do as like one of their first works, and I think they were maybe a bit overstretched. But the show, obviously, um, there's there's clearly a lot of love put into it, and I think, I think it smooths out a little bit as it goes, or maybe I just got used to it. Um, and then once I realized that the show is also kind of a campy 
like road trip comedy, the goofiness of the bears kind of fit in. And then I started to enjoy them. They'd show up and I'd be like, yay, it's a bear. So um, well played. Well played, Golden Comedy Animation staff. Yeah, I actually don't know how the story does it. Like it, it has... And I think, like, if you if you want to say anything good about the anime adaptation, it's that they managed to keep whatever magic is occurring in the manga still going, where there's scenes that are, like, horrific but still funny. Uh, mm-hmm. Or, like, they're, it, they can just effortlessly transition from the scene where, like, Sugimoto is slowly pushing his knife into a guy's chest to, like, him and Astripa cooking a meal and him getting really grossed out because he has to eat a fish eye or something. And it just... There's like, it's such a big tonal change, right? But it feels so organic that mm-hmm. it you don't question whether it happened in the same universe, the same story. You just accept it. And the, I didn't ever get the like that kind of dissonance in the anime either. So that has to be hard. That's got, that's got to be hard, doing something like that. I think it's the setting. Like, these characters have a really hard life. So when they do have a chance to have fun, they really go all out with just amazing faces when they're eating. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's worth uh, saying that uh, there is kind of one problematic element in I think it was the second to last episode uh the hotel episode where I I knew this was going to happen uh so going into this I was a bit wary uh there's a uh I guess trans serial killer uh who eats people to remain young forever yeah but and I was like oh no this episode but then that became literally my favorite episode the murder hotel yeah I like I loved the the atomic kabedon that Ushiyama did I loved that, like, that split panel where it showed where everyone was standing, like, in a cross-section of the hotel. Yeah. Yeah, I paused on that, because that was so cool. Yeah, I really want to get to that in the manga to see, like, because I I bet it's, like, a a double-page spread or something like that. I loved Ianaga, too, where uh, she was just like, I I guess I'll kill him, and then she just drops him into the the death trap. It was... Yeah, the thing is... I really enjoy it's Ianaga is her name, right? Because yeah. in the episode they just call her the proprietress for most of it, so I, I couldn't. Ianaga. Um, sometimes they call her him. There was there's so okay. I I went back and watched the episode and paid very close attention to the Japanese. Uh-huh. It's it's complicated and it's not like it's not well done. Like I want I want to like make it clear that like this is absolutely an issue and like if this was the deal breaker for folks I would completely understand. I think all three of us really enjoyed the series, but yeah. like I get it. The way the characters refer to her is when they're talking about, about when when they when they talk about knowing her in the prison, they refer to her as the uh, as the Gigi, which is um, Japanese for like old geezer, and it it refers to men in general. So when and so when they shift into speaking about like this person we knew in prison, they use that term. Um, and then when they're but but anytime they're talking about her in the present day, they refer to her as the proprietress, which is a gendered term. It's Okami. And so the the subtitle translation, they never use like actual pronouns, um, but the subtitle translation kind of tries to walk that line. So when they're referring to her kind of in the past tense, they slip into he at one point, but by and large they they maintain the she, which is w- which would come with the Okami. Um, so the sense I get, and this is again, I'm not an expert on this subject. Folks at home, please let us know in the comments what we're getting what we're getting wrong here. My understanding is that it is not super uncommon in Japan um, in the current day, even like even among uh, trans folks. Like like we have the manga "The Bride Was a Boy," which the uh, author the author like okayed that title and wanted that to be the title. And um, yeah, have which you read is... that? Because she talks about like when like when I was a boy, which yeah, which I know that a lot of people would find very offensive. Like, if I said to a trans person, hey, back when you were this. Yeah, no, um, and this is, it, it's one of those things where, where different different cultures, different societies are moving in different directions, and so, like, I super don't want to talk over, like, Japanese trans folks in this situation. My understanding is that it's still fairly common to to refer to, in the past tense, to refer to yourself by what your presentation was at the time. So it's not all that unusual. So the fact that Golden Kamui does that, like, shifts between the two is... I, I think is I think is about as respectful as it can get, given the fact that this is also a trans cannibal serial killer character. Um, there is a um, a long history of uh, like evil trans characters in media, and so like the act of having a trans villain like is kind of inherently problematic because of that long history. Which again is why I get like if if this like really upsets folks, totally get it. Um, like you know again feel feel free to feel free to discuss. If you can get past that, I think the series handles it about as well as it can. 
Um, she's she's going to stick around. We'll have we'll see more of her in season two, so we'll get a better feel. I'm kind of reserving judgment until I see kind of how they handle her. Um, but this is, I mean, this is like we said, this is kind of a wild sort of campy show about a lot of like bonkers murderers. So um, she fits into the universe. But it, yeah, it's one of those it's one of those things where it's it's hard to talk about. Um, again, I don't think it, the three of us are necessarily the most uh, qualified to discuss it anyway. So it is something that I would I would encourage our, our trans listeners to to weigh in on for sure and kind of how how you how you saw her how you felt about her um all of that you know let us know for sure yeah but outside that it's amazing i i had a i had a good time like like you said it is um it is so much more absurd than i think i was expecting it to be like even a lot of the action scenes are ridiculous yeah like i mean the freaking orca whale that just like jumps up on the beach and grabs a dude out of <laughs> out nowhere of yeah i i laughed until i about cried like i had to pause because i couldn't i couldn't read the subtitles because i was laughing so hard <laughs> at that scene and he was so happy about it <laughs> he was so happy about being tossed around by the orca whale um yeah it's it's the weirdest show and i i don't know i don't know exactly how it works but i love that it works uh by and large so yeah i enjoyed golden comedy a lot i like i like the glimpses into i knew culture that it gives i think it's i think it's so far been um very respectful i know the there's been a lot of uh articles and stuff about how much the creator like researched this and talked to actual i knew people and wanted to make sure they got it right um and you know i i Super appreciate that because you do not see I knew culture in anime like hardly at all. So and the production was very serious about it as well. Um, I, mm-hmm. I, I'll go ahead and plug the work I've been doing. Uh, Crunchyroll's been translating all the official interviews that they did with uh, staff and cast on the Golden mm-hmm. Camway website, and we've been putting it up. Uh, it's under my byline on Crunchyroll, uh, and I, so I've been I've been posting these things and reading all the interviews, and like pretty much everybody who's working on the project has gone to Hokkaido, like went to a Ainu museum, went to a uh, Ainu village like had tools demonstrated for them. All of them read the manga and loved it. And they were they there. You get the sense that uh, everybody is very serious about portraying Ainu accurately. That's like the kind of the through line I'm getting from all these interviews. So I just reading this, I got a, a, a much more respect for the way the anime was made because it seems like they're really paying a lot of attention to how. I knew are portrayed and trying to to make it true to life and respectful. That makes me so happy. So it's like we're learning new stuff with Golden Kamui. Yeah, a couple of them said that they they were happy to work on the anime because it was an opportunity for them to learn as well. So, uh, yeah, even they're getting something out of it. It's a really good interview series. A lot of the interviews are really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should check those out for sure. Uh, Now that I've I I finished the series like two days before we did this podcast because I, I really just binged it kind of on a whim this past week because I was like, yeah, I should probably catch up on that one so we can talk about it and ended up having a really good time with it. And Asirpa is great. So Asirpa, that's kind of how they pronounce it in the Japanese, but I don't know if that's necessarily, yeah, Asirpa, I guess. Mm-hmm. She's so good. So yeah, I guess that's Golden Kamui. Anything else you guys want to add? I feel like we gushed about that for a bit. And we talked about a lot of the uh, Asirpa, uh, Sugimoto kind of like dynamic and how great Asirpa is in the uh, the mid season podcast too. So that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can direct folks to that if they uh, for more on uh, that sort of central relationship. But yeah, it it, it would have been remiss for us not to talk about the uh, the trans character who shows up near the end. So I'm I'm glad we spent most of our conversation time on that. Yeah. Okay, guys, we are way over time, but we haven't talked about sequels at all. So uh, do we want to like lightning round this? And I'll give everyone like, you get like three sentences. Sure. All right. Go. All right. Lightning round. Uh, we'll start at the top and work our way down. Amanshu Advance really loved it. Was planning on recommending it. Uh, in episode 11, they no homo the main characters as hard as they possibly can with a whole line that's like, oh, you're a boy. So your feelings for her are, are obviously going to be different than my feelings for her because I am a girl. And I don't know if I've ever been that disappointed in a show in a single line of dialogue. Um, it was awful. So Amanchu's great. Just stop at episode 10 of season two and you're good to go. Next, card capture soccer to clear card. Peter, go. It was, I'm, I guess, maybe halfway through the story. Uh, they're probably going to make a new season. So I liked what I watched, even though it got a super slow start. Kind of ended on a high point with a really great conversation between her older brother and her father. Uh, which I was not expecting came out of nowhere. It took like it was like seven minutes of just dialogue that was really excellent. So I'm actually now excited for the next season. So high point. Oh, that's nice to hear. That's the most positive uh, review of Card Capture Soccer Clear Card I've heard thus far. Yeah, so, I don't know why I'm people said they didn't it. like the ending. I, the ending's yeah. the part I liked the most. Okay, the next one's Darling in the Franks. I might skip this one because I think we're planning. A, it's first of all, the show's not over yet. Yeah. Right? Am I correct? Yeah, in that? it's not yeah. over. Um, 
at least two it's running episodes. late it's the timeline on it is weird um so we can't really talk about it in its entirety and i think caitlin is scheduled i think caitlin's planning a um like a single retrospective because there is so much to unpack in that hot mess yeah we have to mm-hmm. lauren mm-hmm. real quick i'm not sure if you're going to be on that podcast uh any any lightning round thoughts you want to you want to add to the <laughs> to the franks course yeah for a show that seems to be about um encouraging reproduction this sure destroyed my marriage for a while <laughs> like pretty much every fight in my house was about a uh, john would be like oh um they're just they're just trying to um to parody this idea and i'm like no they are they're absolutely getting into conservative politics here so he was desperately hoping that they were going to go someplace with it and you were like no john you're giving it too much credit yeah for him optimism was the big destroyer and i was already uh, my my hopes were already dashed but we're still going to watch to the end okay well i mean at this point you're already in for a penny and for a pound right mm-hmm. um and yeah, I think we'll I think we'll discuss this in detail on a on a separate podcast. Um, next one I had on the list was Hozuki's Cool Headedness. I like it, but I've been very busy and I haven't started the new season yet. I will get to it one of these days. Um, next one, this might this is going to be a, the longest of the lightning rounds. My Hero Academia season three. Peter, go. Oh wow, awesome, stupendous, fantastic. This stretch had probably its greatest episode and maybe one of the greatest moments in shonen anime. So you should definitely pick the series up if you haven't already. Uh, it's very good. Lauren. Uh, I love it. I mean, even today, if you haven't seen it yet, it's kind of a fluff episode. And even that just kept my attention the whole time. I love these kids and their hijinks and how they all interact. All right, my turn. Um, I actually came within a hair's breadth of dropping the show about three episodes in. Damn. Um, I stalled for almost the entire season. And then one Friday evening, I went, okay, you know what? I'm going to give it another try because everybody likes it. And it's nice to be able to like talk about shows with my friends. And then I immediately got sucked back into it. and It was great. But the, so here's the thing about my hero. Um, it frequent, the first couple episodes of this season was a lot of like mean at a bullshit and girls getting sexually harassed and female characters getting treated like crap. And I got really annoyed with it. Um, when it's not doing that, my hair academia, like you guys said, is great. And I love it. And so the rest of this season was excellent. But it's I think it's going to keep wearing on me. Like every time every time it, it slides into that, into the um, the kind of like sexist stereotypes and the harassment is funny nonsense, it's going to lose me a little bit more every time it does it. So that is that is my that's kind of my big thing with it. I, I am very glad I came back again. I've, I've enjoyed this season a lot since those first couple episodes. But I, I get it if people are like, no, I'm done. It's it. If you can't, if Mineta's too much, then yeah, that's yeah, understandable. Yeah, he's, he's not going to go away. No, but he's none the of the characters, what I like is that the girls don't take him seriously, but he is still there. And and the teachers don't do anything about it. Like yeah. nobody, uh, bless his soul, Ida actually tries to stop him and is the only boy in that entire pool full of so-called heroes who actually tries to stop him from peeking on the girls in the bath in their, on, on their side of the wall. Koda was the true hero for making an attempt on his life. I think Coda did good, and yeah. and Ida's Ida is Ida's a good boy, and he's the best boy, and I'll fight anyone in the street about that one. No, Mirada sucks, and and then then again, like and then like you get these you get these adult heroines, and they have jokes about wanting to marry the teenage kids, which is not great. Yeah. Um, and they frequently get sidelined, and like. Momo builds a tracking device for them, which is awesome, and gets them costumes, which is awesome. And then the actual fight comes around, and all the guys do something, and Momo just stands there. It's it's little things like that that just I, I want to just love this show wholeheartedly, and I'm so close to it. So those little things stand out all the more, because of how much I just wanna I just wanna love it because there's so much good in here. Sorry, I I know I'm kind of I'm kind of um, railing on on a show that I, I genuinely enjoy, but I did come very close to dropping it, and I just kind of had to. No, it's fine. Why. I feel like. Yeah, it's easier to focus on, like, the everything but about a show, you know? Like, mm-hmm. if, if something is really good, then it's, like, even more worth criticizing. Well, if it's a show that we just don't like, we're just not going to spend time on it or care about yeah, how it and, can do better. Yeah, and that's my thing. Like, I think it's so close to being just, like, the complete package of, of just a really excellent series about superheroes for, you know, a young adult audience. And so every time it does those things where I'm like, oh, you're kind of teaching like most of the time you're you're teaching your audience like really good admirable things and then every once in a while this this crap comes up and i just it i just cringe yeah but overall really good sorry that lightning round went longer um but 
uh, we had all been watching it, so I thought we might need to talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. All those things, I think, are going to be things that poisons its legacy, which really sucks. And I hope it gets yeah. better. But It's too bad. I, I would like to – yeah, my hope is that um, – I loved – one thing I do want to say, I loved that All Might's mentor – is a woman yep. and we get flashbacks of her like inspiring him during during the big the big fight he has in this arc. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. That's the kind of stuff I want to see more of. I just want to see more of that balance of of you know women being able to inspire men in the same way that the that the guys inspire each other and also sometimes the the ladies. It'd be great if there was a hero like her alive though. Yeah, I mean, you're right. But I'm focusing on that because I thought that was really good and that's a good that's a good place the show could build from. And so I would like to see more of that going forward. That would be fantastic. Next show on the list, Science Gate Zero. I'm the only one watching it. It's trash, but by God, I can't stop watching. I'm I'm into the uh, I, I get into the twisty time travel mystery element of the stupid thing, and I get sucked in. And it's got a lot of the same light novel bullshit that the first season had. So I can't, in good conscience, recommend it to anybody. But um, I look forward to it every week, and I uh, I want to see where the, where the heck it's taking itself. So um, also one one point I will give in its favor. Um, the main character has like legit, like has PTSD and is dealing with grief for pretty much the entire series. And that doesn't go away. Like it continues to crop up and he continues to have like near panic attacks and gets, and get ill in like with certain triggers. And so I appreciate the way the show handles, um, is handling those elements, even if it also throws in some of the crappy fan service and, um, is really, really not good with Rukako, who is functionally a trans character. And, um, the series just refuse just continuously misgenders her and it's really really frustrating um but yeah no i'm watching steins gate zero next record of grand crest war lauren go you finished it right yeah, it's done I sure did i had to review it for anime news network which is why i finished it okay yeah i did not even want it but it got but people voted for the second core as well as the first so i just kept going it's basically popular. it's about a uh, main male character who can do everything right. It's a high fantasy. He conquers everything and becomes the emperor at the end. Um, he has a <laughs> he has an advisor, a woman named Silica, who is a mage. She's like the most brilliant mage ever, and she's also uh, a very talented um, tactician and and dip- diplomat. And at first, she's like helping the guy, mm-hmm. teaching him everything he knows. But then, you know, it's it's just like how every movie goes, where the guy then easily picks up the stuff that has taken Silica her whole life to learn, uh, um, sweeps her off, her off her feet. So this woman, who is known for her silver tongue, no longer has anything. She, 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 is spe- she is rendered speechless a lot of the time. Like, he no longer needs her. She is just his bride after that. Also, Ugh. another character I'm loses her virginity and has to wear black at her wedding. The end. <laughs> <laughs> In the beginning, we see her wearing white at her wedding, which gets broken up by high Demon. fantasy. But, you right. know, at the yeah, end, yeah, yeah. you can't wear white anymore. What are you trying to do? I'm so glad I dropped it. <laughs> I feel like I dropped it at the exact right moment. Um, so, hooray. Not a recommendation, I take it, Lauren. No, no, not at all. Okay, and then the last the last one we have here is also you, Yoamushi Petal Glory Line. Go. Well, I mean, I loved Yoamushi Petal at the beginning. Me too. And yeah. I just am kind of going with it on momentum. I like it best when it's about Onida because he's a very gripping ray of sunshine character who I just care a lot Mm -hmm. about. So what I I was really excited about, and just the only thing I'm going to say about this, is that I was so excited for the trans-coded character, Shinkai Mm -hmm. Yuto. Yeah, you were talking about that in the group chat. Yeah, so their um, gender exploration has really only occurred in the after credit scenes. And I feel like you really have to squint for it. They, they will say to other characters, oh, you like feminine stuff as well, and they'll get really excited. But mm-hmm. it's really them misunderstanding different things. Like, Onida really likes uh, shoujo anime, and Yuto mm-hmm. thinks that they've found a kindred spirit, and they have, not, they have really not. And um, it's just, the reason I was excited at all is that, is that the creator of Yamushi Petal, um, Watanabe, has said that um, later we'll find out in the anime if Yuto wants to be a girl. That was the question that that was posed to the creator. And he uh-huh. said, we'll see. So I've been uh. waiting for that and nothing happened, of course, the end. Damn. Ah. Uh. 
That's kind of a downer note to end on. Maybe we should have wrapped up on My Hero so we well, could have all. There's anyway, one more. Peter, you'll just remix it, right? It's fine. There's, Wait, there's there's one more there's sequel? There's one more I want to bring up. Uh, to Be okay, Hero sure. started in the middle of the season. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and I wanted to watch some of that just so I could plug it or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I've watched three episodes of like the four or five that are out right now, and mm-hmm. it's very weird it's uh it's got this crazy it's originally all in chinese i think but when the when they translated to japanese uh there's like a real world and a fantasy world this girl's living in and they made the Mm -hmm. fantasy world in japanese and the real world is still in chinese i feel like it's a good and a bad anime depending upon which world you're in the real world is really interesting uh she is she's got this group of friends and one friend like uh she was always hanging out with these two boys when they were kids they would play like fantasy games together where she's like wizard, another guy's a knight, and the one last one has a gun, I guess. But uh, I think one of her friends during some sort of riot, so I guess there's a lot of social unrest they haven't really explored yet. Uh, his dad was killed and his mom was hit in the head. And ever since, she's been kind of not present. She kind of lost her optimism and her hope mm-hmm. that, like, she thinks as she gets older, she's going to be less and less happy. And this is like... <laughs> It seems too real. Yeah, these are in flashbacks while she's in a fantasy world with these weird babies who fight by uh, turning clothes into historical characters that fight each other called speed cloths. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's an odd swerve. Yeah. <laughs> it's got really good animation at points, uh, and it's really funny at points. It's also got some problematic stuff, um, but I think... The real life half of the anime. Fan really service is probably an issue, given the clothing element. Uh, not so. In the first episode, the guy has. Uh, so you can tell if somebody's not a speed cloth because they wear underwear, which is the thing that keeps you alive. If your underwear is taken off, you die. Uh, okay. So he checks to make sure she's wearing underwear. But after that, like, she's got, like, it's winter, her winter outfit. So she hasn't really dressed down yet. She's, like, used her boots or her oh, okay. sweater or her backpack. Uh, mm-hmm. So not yet at least. They do do this bad thing in real life. uh, She gets bullied by some people and the two boys show up to save her and then they both get their asses kicked and then this one girl shows up and beats the shit out of literally everybody there and she becomes one of their friends who knows kung fu or something. And there's like a fantasy allegory for all of her real life friends in the fantasy world. The Mm -hmm. allegory for that girl is a they're all babies. Uh, It's a baby who's wearing female underwear instead of like boy underwear but also has like five o'clock shadow so that I don't I guess they're saying since she's good at martial arts in the fantasy world she's kind of like a an okama or something I don't know what they're where they're trying to go with that but I'm very worried yeah yeah I don't I don't love that yeah the real life version is really good so like I feel if you watch the real life portion of the anime it's got a lot but if you the fantasy world keeps dipping into like please don't do that territory but it's interesting. Yeah, maybe it's one I'll check out. I haven't, I haven't given it a try yet because, again, there was a lot going on this this season. But uh, um, I guess that's it. Uh, you guys, anything else you want to talk about, or should I do the wrap up? We should probably stop. Yeah, we've been talking <laughs> for a long time. Um, all right. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Chatty AF. If you like what you heard tell your friends and if you really liked what you heard we'd love it if you'd head over to www.patreon.com backslash anime feminist and become a patron for uh, as little as one dollar a month your support really does go a long way towards making anime feminist happen both in print and in your earbuds if you're interested in more from the team and our contributors please check us out at www.animefeminist.com on facebook at anime fem on Tumblr at Anime Feminist, and on Twitter at Anime Feminist. And that is the end of our show. Thanks for listening, Annie Fam, and we will catch you next week. <laughs>